This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Chapter 17 Spring the opening of large tracts by the ice-cutters commonly causes a pond to break up earlier, for the water agitated by the wind, even in cold weather, wears away the surrounding ice. But such was not the effect on Walden that year, for she had soon got a thick new garment to take the place of the old. This pond never breaks up so soon as the others in this neighborhood. On account both of its greater depth and its having no stream passing through it to melt or wear away the ice. I never knew it to open in the course of a winter, not excepting that of fifty two fifty three, which gave the pond so severe a trial. It commonly opens about the first of April, a week or ten days later than Flint's Pond and Fair Haven beginning to melt on the north side and in the shallower parts where it began to freeze. It indicates better than any water hereabouts the absolute progress of the season, being least affected by transient changes of temperature. A severe cold of a few days' duration in March may very much retard the opening of the former ponds while the temperature of Walden increases almost uninterruptedly. A thermometer thrust into the middle of Walden on the 6th of March, 1847, stood at 32 degrees, or freezing point, near the shore at 33 degrees, in the middle of Flint's Pond, the same day, at 32 plus degrees, at a dozen rods from the shore, in shallow water under ice a foot thick, at thirty-six degrees. This difference of three and a half degrees between the temperature of the deep water and the shallow in the latter pond, and the fact that a great proportion of it is comparatively shallow, show why it should break up so much sooner than Walden. The ice in the shallowest part was at this time several inches thinner than in the middle. In midwinter the middle had been the warmest and the ice thinnest there. So also every one who has waded about the shores of the pond in summer must have perceived how much warmer the water is close to the shore, where only three or four inches deep, then a little distance out, and on the surface where it is deep, then near the bottom. In spring the sun not only exerts an influence through the increased temperature of the air and earth, but its heat passes through ice a foot or more thick, and is reflected from the bottom in shallow water, and so also warms the water and melts the underside of the ice, at the same time that it is melting it more directly above, making it uneven, and causing the air bubbles which it contains to extend themselves upward and downward until it is comparatively honeycombed, and at last disappears suddenly in a single spring rain. Ice has its grain as well as wood, and when a cake begins to rot or comb, that is, assume the appearance of honeycomb, whatever may be its position, the air cells are at right angles with what was the water surface. Where there is a rock or a log rising near to the surface, the ice over it is much thinner, and is frequently quite dissolved by this reflected heat. And I have been told that in the experiment at Cambridge to freeze water in a shallow wooden pond, through the cold air circulating underneath, and so had access to both sides, the reflection of the sun from the bottom more than counterbalanced this advantage. When a warm rain in the middle of the winter melts off the snow ice from Walden, and leaves a hard, dark, or transparent ice on the middle, there will be a strip of rotten, though thicker, white ice 
a rod or more wide, about the shores, created by this reflected heat. Also, as I have said, the bubbles themselves within the ice operate as burning glasses to melt the ice beneath. The phenomena of the year take place every day in a pond on a small scale. Every morning, generally speaking, the shallow water is being warmed more rapidly than the deep, though it may not be made so warm after all, and every evening it is being cooled more rapidly until the morning. The day is an epitome of the year. The night is the winter. The morning and evening are the spring and fall, and the noon is the summer. The cracking and booming of the ice indicate a change of temperature. One pleasant morning after a cold night, February 24, 1850, having gone to Flint's Pond to spend the day, I noticed with surprise that when I struck the ice with the head of my axe, it resounded like a gong for many rods around, or as if I had struck on a tight drumhead. The pond began to boom about an hour after sunrise, when it felt the influence of the sun's rays slanted upon it from over the hills. It stretched itself and yawned like a waking man with a gradually increasing tumult, which was kept up three or four hours. It took a short siesta at noon, and boomed once more toward night, as the sun was withdrawing its influence. In the right stage of the weather a pond fires its evening gun with great regularity. But in the middle of the day, being full of cracks, and the air also being less elastic, it had completely lost its resonance, and probably fishes and muskrats could not then have been stunned by a blow on it. The fishermen say that the thundering of the pond scares the fishes and prevents their biting. The pond does not thunder every evening, and I cannot tell surely when to expect its thundering. But though I may perceive no difference in the weather, it does. Who would have suspected so large and cold and thick-skinned a thing to be so sensitive? Yet it has its law, to which it thunders obedience when it should, as surely as the buds expand in the spring. The earth is all alive, and covered with papillae. The largest pond is as sensitive to atmospheric changes as the globule of mercury in its tube. One attraction in coming to the woods to live was that I should have leisure and opportunity to see the spring come in. The ice in the pond at length begins to be honeycombed, and I can set my heel in it as I walk. Fogs and rains and warmer suns are gradually melting the snow. The days have grown sensibly longer, and I see how I shall get through the winter without adding to my woodpile, for large fires are no longer necessary. I am on the alert for the first signs of spring to hear the chance note of some arriving bird, or the striped squirrel's chirp, for his stores must be now nearly exhausted, or see the woodchuck venture out of his winter quarters. On the 13th of March, after I had heard the bluebird, song sparrow and red wing, the ice was still nearly a foot thick. As the weather grew warmer, it was not sensibly worn away by the water, nor broken up and floated off as in rivers, but though it was completely melted for half a rod in width about the shore, the middle was merely honeycombed and saturated with water, so that you could put your foot through it when six inches thick. But by the next day evening, perhaps, after a warm rain followed by fog, it would have wholly disappeared all gone off with the fog, spirited away. One year I went across the middle only five days before it disappeared entirely. 
In 1845 Walden was first comparatively open on the 1st of April. In 46, the 25th of March. In 47, the 8th of April. In 51, the 28th of March. In 52, the 18th of April. In 53, the 23rd of March. In 54, about the 7th of April. Every incident connected with the breaking up of the rivers and ponds and the settling of the weather is particularly interesting to us who live in a climate of so great extremes. When the warmer days come, they who dwell near the river hear the ice crack at night with a startling whoop as loud as artillery, as if its icy fetters were rent from end to end, and within a few days see it rapidly going out. So the alligator comes out of the mud with quakings of the earth. One old man, who has been a close observer of nature, and seems as thoroughly wise in regard to all her operations as if she had been put upon the stocks when he was a boy, he had helped to lay her keel, who has come to his growth and can hardly acquire more of natural lore if he should live to the age of Methuselah, told me, and I was surprised to hear him express wonder at any of nature's operations, for I thought that there were no secrets between them, that one spring day he took his gun and boat, and thought that he would have a little sport with the ducks. There was ice still on the meadows, but it was all gone out of the river, and he dropped down without obstruction from Sudbury, where he lived, to Fairhaven Pond, which he found unexpectedly covered for the most part with a firm field of ice. It was a warm day, and he was surprised to see so great a body of ice remaining. Not seeing any ducks, he hid his boat on the north or back side of an island in the pond, and then concealed himself in the bushes on the south side to await them. The ice was melted for three or four rods from the shore, and there was a smooth and warm sheet of water with a muddy bottom, such as the ducks love, within, and he thought it likely, that some would be along pretty soon. After he had lain still there about an hour, he heard a low and seemingly very distant sound, but singularly grand and impressive, unlike anything he had ever heard, gradually swelling and increasing as if it would have a universal and memorable ending, a sullen rush and roar, which seemed to him all at once like the sound of a vast body of fowl coming in to settle there, and seizing his gun he started up in haste and excited, but he found to his surprise that the whole body of the ice had started while he lay there and drifted into the shore, and the sound he had heard was made by its edge grating on the shore, at first gently nibbled and crumbled off, but at length heaving up and scattering its wrecks along the island to a considerable height before it came to a standstill. At length the sun's rays have attained the right angle, and warm winds blow up mist and rain and melt the snow banks, and the sun dispersing the mist smiles on a checkered landscape of russet and white smoking with incense, through which the traveller picks his way from islet to islet, cheered by the music of a thousand tinkling rills and rivulets whose veins are filled with the blood of winter which they are bearing off. Few phenomena gave me more delight to observe the forms which thawing sand and clay assume in flowing down the sides of a deep cut on the railroad, through which I passed on my way to the village. A phenomenon not very common on so large a scale, though the number of freshly exposed banks of the right material must have been greatly multiplied since railroads were invented. The material was sand of every degree of fineness and of rich colors commonly mixed with a little clay. 
when the frost comes out in the spring, and even in a thawing day in the winter, the sand begins to flow down the slopes like lava, sometimes bursting out through the snow and overflowing it, where no sand was to be seen before. Innumerable little streams overlap and interlace one with another, exhibiting a sort of hybrid product, which obeys halfway the law of currents and halfway that of vegetation. As it flows it takes the form of sappy leaves or vines, making heaps of pulpy sprays a foot or more in depth, and resembling, as you look down on them, the laciniated, lobed, and imbrigated thalluses of some lichens, or you are reminded of coral, of leopards' paws or birds' feet, of brains or lungs or bowels, and excrements of all kinds. It is a truly grotesque vegetation, whose form and color we see imitated in bronze, a sort of architectural foliage more ancient and typical than acanthus, chicory, ivy, vine, or any vegetable leaves, destined perhaps under some circumstances to become a puzzle to future geologists. The whole cut impressed me as if it were a cave with its stalactites laid open to the light. The various shades of the sand are singularly rich and agreeable, embracing the different iron colors, brown, gray, yellowish, and reddish. When the flowing mass reaches the drain at the foot of the bank, it spreads out flatter into strands, the separate streams losing their semi-cylindrical form, and gradually becoming more flat and broad running together as they are more moist till they form an almost flat sand, still variously beautifully shaded, but in which you can trace the original forms of vegetation, till at length, in the water itself, they are converted into banks, like those formed off the mouths of rivers, and the forms of vegetation are lost in the ripple marks on the bottom. The whole bank which is from twenty to forty feet high, is sometimes overlaid with a mass of this kind of foliage, or sandy rupture, for a quarter of a mile on one or both sides, the produce of one spring day. What makes this sand foliage remarkable is its springing into existence thus suddenly. When I see on the one side the inert bank, for the sun acts on one side first, and on the other this luxuriant foliage and the creation of an hour, I am affected as if in a peculiar sense I stood in the laboratory of the artist who made the world and me, had come to where he was still at work, sporting on this bank and with excess of energy strewing his fresh designs about. I feel as if I were nearer to the vitals of the globe, for this sandy overflow is something such a foliaceous mass as the vitals of the animal body. You find thus in the very sands an anticipation of the vegetable leaf. No wonder that the earth expresses itself outwardly in leaves, it so labors the idea inwardly. The atoms have already learned this law, and are pregnant by it. The overhanging leaf sees here its prototype. Internally, whether in the globe or animal body, it is a moist, thick lobe, a word especially applicable to the liver and lungs and the leaves of fat, genai, labor, lapsus, to flow or slip downward a lapsing, Gyas, globus, lobe, globe, also lap, flap, and other words. Externally a dry, thin leaf, even as the F and V are a pressed and dried B. The radicals of lobe are lb, the soft mass of the B, 
single-lobed or b-double-lobed, with the liquid L behind it pressing it forward, in globe, glub, the guttural g adds to the meaning the capacity of the throat. The feathers and wings of birds are still drier and thinner leaves. Thus also you pass from the lumpish grub in the earth to the airy and fluttering butterfly. The very globe continually transcends and translates itself, and becomes winged in its orbit. Even ice begins with delicate crystal leaves, as if it had flowed into molds which the fronds of water plants have impressed on the watery mirror. The whole tree itself is but one leaf, and rivers are still vaster leaves whose pulp is intervening earth, and towns and cities are the ova of insects in their axils. When the sun withdraws and the sand ceases to flow, but in the morning the streams will start once more and branch and branch again into a myriad of others. You here see, perchance, how blood vessels are formed. If you look closely, you observe that first there pushes forward from the thawing mass a stream of softened sand with a drop-like point, like the ball of the finger, feeling its way slowly and blindly downward until at last with more heat and moisture as the sun gets higher the most fluid portion, in its effort to obey the law to which the most inert also yields, separates from the latter and forms for itself a meandering channel or artery within that, in which is seen a little silvery stream glancing like lightning from one stage of pulpy leaves or branches to another, and ever and anon swallowed up in the sand. It is wonderful how rapidly yet perfectly the sand organizes itself as it flows. Using the best material its mass affords to form the sharp edges of its channel. Such are the sources of rivers, in the silicious manner which the water deposits is perhaps the bony system and in the still finer soil and organic matter the fleshy fiber or cellular tissue. What is man but a mass of thawing clay? The ball of the human finger is but a drop congealed. The fingers and toes flow to their extent from the thawing mass of the body. Who knows what the human body would expand and flow out to under a more genial heaven? Is not the hand a spreading palm leaf with its lobes and veins? The ear may be regarded fancifully as a lichen umbilicaria on the side of the head with its lobe or drop. The lip labium from labor, laps or lapses from the sides of the cavernous mouth. The nose is a manifest congealed drop or stalactite. The chin is a still larger drop, the confluent dripping of the face. The cheeks are a slide from the brows into the valleys of the face, opposed and diffused by the cheekbones. Each rounded lobe of the vegetable leaf, too, is a thick and now loitering drop, larger or smaller. The lobes are the fingers of the leaf, and as many lobes as it has, in so many directions it tends to flow, and more heat or other genial influences would have caused it to flow yet farther. Thus it seemed that this one hillside illustrated the principle of all the operations of nature. The maker of this earth but patented a leaf. 
What Champollion will decipher this hieroglyphic for us, that we may turn over a new leaf at last? This phenomenon is more exhilarating to me than the luxuriance and fertility of vineyards. True, it is somewhat excrementitious in its character, and there is no end to the heaps of liver, lights, and bowels, as if the globe were turned wrong side outward. But this suggests at least that nature has some bowels, and there again is mother of humanity. This is the frost coming out of the ground. This is spring. It precedes the green and flowery spring, as mythology precedes regular poetry. I know of nothing more purgative of winter fumes and indigestions. Fresh curls spring from the baldest brow. There is nothing inorganic. These foliaceous heaps lie along the bank like the slag of a furnace, showing that nature is in full blast within. The earth is not a mere fragment of dead history, stratum upon stratum like the leaves of a book to be studied by geologists and antiquaries chiefly, but living poetry like the leaves of a tree which precede flowers and fruit. Not a fossil earth, but a living earth, compared with whose great central life all animal and vegetable life is merely parasitic. Its throes will heave our exuviae from their graves. You may melt your metals and cast them into the most beautiful moulds you can. They will never excite me like the forms which this molten earth flows out into. And not only it, but the institutions upon it are plastic like clay in the hands of the potter. Ere long, not only on these banks, but on every hill and plain and in every hollow, the frost comes out of the ground like a dormant quadruped from its burrow, and seeks the sea with music, or migrates to other climes in clouds. Thaw, with his gentle persuasion, is more powerful than Thor with his hammer. The one melts, the other but breaks in pieces. When the ground was partially bare of snow and a few warm days had dried its surface somewhat, it was pleasant to compare the first tender signs of the infant year just peeping forth with the stately beauty of the withered vegetation which had withstood the winter. Life everlasting, golden rods, pinweeds and graceful wild grasses, more obvious and interesting frequently than in summer even, as if their beauty was not ripe till then. Even cotton grass, cattails, moulins, john's wort, hard hack, meadow sweet, and other strong stemmed plants, those unexhausted granaries which entertain the earliest birds, decent weeds, at least which widowed nature wears. I am particularly attracted by the arching and sheaf-like top of the wool-grass. It brings back the summer to our winter memories, and is among the forms which art loves to copy, and which in the vegetable kingdom have the same relation to types already in the mind of man that astronomy has. It is an antique style, older than Greek or Egyptian. Many of the phenomena of winter are suggestive of an inexpressible tenderness and fragile delicacy. We are accustomed to hear this king described as a rude and boisterous tyrant. But with 
the gentleness of a lover he adorns the tresses of summer. At the approach of spring the red squirrels got under my house, two at a time, directly under my feet as I sat reading or writing, and kept up the queerest chuckling and chirruping and vocal pirouetting and gurgling sounds that ever were heard. And when I stamped they only chirruped the louder, as if past all fear and respect in their mad pranks, defying humanity to stop them. No, you don't! Chickadee! Chickadee! They were wholly deaf to my arguments, or failed to perceive their force, and fell into a strain of invective that was irresistible. The first sparrow of spring, the year beginning with younger hope than ever, the faint silvery warblings heard over the partially bare and moist fields from the bluebird, the song sparrow and the red wing, as if the last flakes of winter tinkled as they fell. What at such a time are histories, chronologies, traditions, and all written revelations? The brooks sing carols and glees to the spring. The marsh hawk, sailing low over the meadow, is already seeking the first slimy life that awakes. The sinking sound of melting snow is heard in all dells, and the ice dissolves apace in the ponds. The grass flames up on the hillsides like a spring fire. A primitus oritur herba imbribus primoribus evocata as if the earth sent forth an inward heat to greet the returning sun. Not yellow, but green is the color of its flame, the symbol of perpetual youth, the grass blade, like a long green ribbon, streams from the sod into the summer, checked indeed by the frost, but anon pushing on again, lifting its spear of last year's hay with the fresh life below. It grows as steadily as the rill oozes out of the ground. It is almost identical with that, for in the growing days of June, when the rills are dry, the grass blades are their channels and from year to year the herds drink at this perennial green stream, and the mower draws from it betimes their winter supply. So our human life but dies down to its root, and still puts forth its green blade to eternity. Walden is melting apace. There is a canal two rods wide along the northerly and westerly sides, and wider still at the east end. A great field of ice has cracked off from the main body. I hear a song sparrow singing from the bushes on the shore. Olit, 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 chip, 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 chichar, chawis, whis, whis. He too is helping to crack it. How handsome the great sweeping curves in the edge of the ice, answering somewhat to those of the shore, but more regular. It is unusually hard, owing to the recent severe but transient cold, and all watered or waved like a palace floor. But the wind slides eastward over its opaque surface in vain till it reaches the living surface beyond. It is glorious to behold this ribbon of water sparkling in the sun, the bare face of the pond full of glee and youth, as if it spoke the joy of the fishes within it and of the sands on its shore a silvery sheen as from the scales of a leuciscus. 
as it were all one active fish. Such is the contrast between winter and spring. Walden was dead, and is alive again. But this spring is broke up more steadily, as I have said. The change from storm and winter to serene and mild weather, from dark and sluggish hours to bright and elastic ones, is a memorable crisis which all things proclaim. It is seemingly instantaneous at last. Suddenly an influx of light filled my house, though the evening was at hand, and the clouds of winter still overhung it, and the eaves were dripping with sleety rain. I looked out the window, and, lo, where yesterday was cold gray ice there lay the transparent pond, already calm and full of hopes as in a summer evening, reflecting a summer evening sky in its bosom, though none was visible overhead, as if it had intelligence with some remote horizon. I heard a robin in the distance, the first I had heard for many a thousand years, methought, the same sweet and powerful song as of yore. Oh, the evening robin, at the end of a New England summer day. If I could ever find the twig he sits upon, I mean he, I mean the twig. This at last is not the Turdus migratorius, the pitch pines and shrub oaks about my house, which had so long drooped, suddenly resumed their several characters, looked brighter, greener, and more erect and alive, as if effectually cleansed and restored by the rain. I knew that it would not rain any more. You may tell by looking at any twig of the forest, I at your very woodpile, whether its winter is past or not. As it grew darker, I was startled by the honking of geese, flying low over the woods like weary travelers getting in late from southern lakes, and indulging at last in unrestrained complaint and mutual consolation. Standing at my door, I could hear the rush of their wings. When, driving toward my house, they suddenly spied my light, and with hushed clamor wheeled and settled in the pond. So I came in, and shut the door, and passed my first spring night in the woods. In the morning I watched the geese from the door through the mist, sailing in the middle of the pond, fifty rods off, so large and tumultuous that Walden appeared like an artificial pond for their amusement. But when I stood on the shore they at once rose up with a great flapping of wings at the signal of their commander, and when they had got into rank circled about over my head, twenty-nine of them, and then steered straight to Canada, with a regular honk from the leader at intervals trusting to break their fast in muddier pools. A plump of ducks rose at the same time, and took the route to the north in the wake of their noisier cousins. For a week I heard the circling, groping clangor of some solitary goose in the foggy mornings, seeking its companion, and still peopling the woods with the sound of a larger life than they could sustain. In April the pigeons were seen again flying express in small flocks, and in due time I heard the martins twittering over my clearing, though it had not seemed that the township contained so many that it could afford me any, and I fancied that they were peculiarly of the ancient race that dwelt in hollow trees ere white men came. In almost all climes the tortoise and the frog are among the precursors and heralds of this season, 
and birds fly with song and glancing plumage, and plants spring and bloom, and winds blow to correct this slight oscillation of the poles and preserve the equilibrium of nature. As every season seems best to us in its turn, so the coming of spring is like the creation of cosmos out of chaos, and the realization of the golden age. Eurus ad aurorum nabatheque regna recessist persidac e radis juga subdita matutinis. The east wind withdrew to her aurora and the Nabathean kingdom, and the Persian and the ridges placed under the morning rays. Man was born, whether the artificer of things, the origin of a better world, made him from the divine seed, or the earth, being recent and lately sundered from the high ether, retained some seeds of cognate heaven. A single gentle rain makes the grass many shades greener, so our prospects brighten on the influx of better thoughts. We should be blessed if we lived in the present always, and took advantage of every accident that befell us, like the grass which confesses the influence of the slightest dew that falls on it, and did not spend our time in atoning for the neglect of past opportunities, which we call doing our duty. We loiter in winter while it is already spring. In a pleasant spring morning all men's sins are forgiven. Such a day is a truce to vice. While such a sun holds out to burn, the vilest sinner may return. Through our own recovered innocence we discern the innocence of our neighbors, you may have known your neighbor yesterday for a thief, a drunkard, or a sensualist, and merely pitied or despised him, and despaired of the world. But the sun shines bright and warm this first spring morning, recreating the world, and you meet him at some serene work, and see how it is exhausted and debauched veins expand with still joy and bless the new day feel the spring influence with the innocence of infancy and all his faults are forgotten there is not only an atmosphere of good will about him but even a savor of holiness groping for expression, blindly and ineffectually, perhaps, like a newborn instinct. And for a short hour the south hillside echoes to no vulgar jest. You see some innocent fair shoots preparing to burst from his gnarled rind and try another year's life, tender and fresh as the youngest plant. Even he has entered into the joy of his Lord. Why the jailer does not leave open his prison doors, why the judge does not dismiss his case, why the preacher does not dismiss his congregation, it is because they do not obey the hint which God gives them, nor accept the pardon which he freely offers to all. A return to goodness produced each day in the tranquil and beneficent breath of the morning causes that in respect to the love of virtue and the hatred of vice one approaches a little the primitive nature of man 
as the sprouts of the forest which has been felled. In like manner, the evil which one does in the interval of a day prevents the germs of virtues which began to spring up again from developing themselves and destroys them. After the germs of virtue have thus been prevented many times from developing themselves, then the beneficent breath of evening does not suffice to preserve them. As soon as the breath of evening does not suffice longer to preserve them, then the nature of man does not differ much from that of the brute. Men, seeing the nature of this man like that of a brute, think that he has never possessed the innate faculty of reason. Are those the true and natural sentiments of man? The golden age was first created, which without any avenger spontaneously without law cherished fidelity and rectitude. Punishment and fear were not, nor were threatening words read on suspended brass, nor did the suppliant crowd fear the words of their judge, but were safe without an avenger. Not yet the pine felled on its mountains had descended to the liquid waves that it might see a foreign world, and mortals knew no shores but their own. There was eternal spring, and placid zephyrs with warm blasts soothed the flowers born without seed. On the twenty-ninth of April, as I was fishing from the bank of the river near the nine-acre corner bridge, standing on the quaking grass and willow roots, where the muskrats lurk, I heard a singular rattling sound, somewhat like that of the sticks which boys play with their fingers. When looking up I observed a very slight and graceful hawk, like a night hawk, alternately soaring like a ripple and tumbling a rod or two over and over, showing the underside of its wings which gleamed like a satin ribbon in the sun, or like the pearly inside of a shell. This sight reminded me of falconry, and what nobleness and poetry are associated with that sport. The merlin, it seemed to me, it might be called, but I care not for its name. It was the most ethereal flight I had ever witnessed. It did not simply flutter like a butterfly, nor soar like the larger hawks, but it sported with proud reliance in the fields of air, mounting again and again with its strange chuckle. It repeated its free and beautiful fall, turning over and over like a kite, and then recovering from its lofty tumbling as if it had never set its foot on terra firma. It appeared to have no companion in the universe, sporting there alone, and to need none but the morning and the ether with which it played. It was not lonely, but made all the earth lonely beneath it. Where was the parent which hatched it, its kindred and its father in the heavens? The tenant of the air, it seemed related to the earth but by an egg hatched some time in the crevice of a crag, or was its native nest made in the angle of a cloud? woven of the rainbow's trimmings and the sunset sky, and lined with some soft midsummer haze caught up from earth, its airy, now some cliffy cloud. Beside this I got a rare mess of golden and silver and bright cuprius fishes, which looked like a string of jewels. Ah! I have penetrated to those meadows on the morning of many a first spring day, jumping from hummock to hummock, 
from willow root to willow root, when the wild river valley and the woods were bathed in so pure and bright a light as would have waked the dead, if they had been slumbering in their graves, as some suppose, there needs no stronger proof of immortality. All things must live in such a light. O oh, death, where was thy sting? O oh, grave, where was thy victory then? Our village life would stagnate if it were not for the unexplored forests and meadows which surround it. We need the tonic of wildness, to wade sometimes in marshes where the bittern and the meadow hen lurk and hear the booming of the snipe, to smell the whispering sedge where only some wilder and more solitary fowl builds her nest, and the mink crawls with its belly close to the ground. At the same time that we are earnest to explore and learn all things, we require that all things be mysterious and unexplorable, that land and sea be infinitely wild, unsurveyed and unfathomed by us because unfathomable. We can never have enough of nature. We must be refreshed by the sight of inexhaustible vigor, vast and titanic features, the sea coast with its wrecks, the wilderness with its living and its decaying trees, the thunder cloud, and the rain which lasts three weeks and produces freshets. We need to witness our own limits transgressed and some life pasturing freely where we never wander. We are cheered when we observe the vulture feeding on the carrion which disgusts and disheartens us, and deriving health and strength from the repast. There was a dead horse in the hollow by the path to my house, which compelled me sometimes to go out of my way, especially in the night when the air was heavy but the assurance it gave me of the strong appetite and inviolable health of nature was my compensation for this. I love to see that nature is so rife with life that myriads can be afforded to be sacrificed and suffered to prey on one another, that tender organizations can be so serenely squashed out of existence like pulp, tadpoles which herons gobble up, and tortoises and toads run over in the road, and that sometimes it has rained flesh and blood. With a liability to accident, we must see how little account is to be made of it. The impression made on a wise man is that of universal innocence. Poison is not poisonous after all, nor are any wounds fatal. Compassion is a very untenable ground. It must be expeditious. Its pleadings will not bear to be stereotyped. Early in May, the oaks, hickories, maples, and other trees, just putting out amidst the pine woods around the pond, imparted a brightness like sunshine to the landscape, especially in cloudy days, as if the sun were breaking through mists and shining faintly on the hillsides as here and there. On the third or fourth of May I saw a loon in the pond, and during the first week of the month I heard the whippoorwill the brown thrasher, the veery, the wood peewee, the chewink, and other birds. I had heard the wood thrush long before. The phoebe had already come once more and looked in at my door and window to see if my house was cavern-like enough for her, sustaining herself on humming wings with clinched talons, as if she held by the air which she surveyed the premises. 
The sulphur-like pollen of the pitch-pine soon covered the ground, and the stones and rotten wood along the shore, so that you could have collected a barrel full. This is the sulphur showers we bear of. Even in Kalidas' drama of Sakontala, we read of rills dyed yellow with the golden dust of the lotus. And so the seasons went rolling on into summer, as one rambles into higher and higher grass. Thus was my first year's life in the woods completed, and the second year was similar to it. I finally left Walden, September 6th, 1847. End of chapter 17